So today, we just heard a brief reading from the last two chapters of Ruth. It's not a large book. Uh, it's, it's one of the shortest books in the Bible. It falls in um, Christian scripture uh, between the Torah and the jo Joshua and then Judges and then Ruth. So it comes at the end of the period of the Judges, Samuel and others, uh, and then prepares and sets the stage for the coming of the king, Saul and then later David and Solomon. In Hebrew scripture, actually, it falls in a different place. It falls in the writings, and uh, there uh, it's an important reading for the Feast of Shavuot or the Harvest Festival, and part of that probably becomes a reading for that particular Jewish festival because it's set in a barley harvest, right? And so it's in the midst of that that we learn a little bit about Ruth. Now, the book of Ruth has got all kinds of symbolism, and if you had all day, we would spend time with that. If you're willing to stay till noon, let me know. But I don't think you are. So I'm going to try to help you get a little bit of the background about what's going on here. So names are important, okay? They mean something. So uh, it's important to know that Naomi means pleasant. Uh, that's the, that's the mother-in-law to Ruth, all right? And, 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 and Elimelech means uh, God is my king. And then Malan and Chilion, the two sons, mean weak and sickly, okay? So you kind of get a fit, a sit, yeah. <laughs> I feel bad for them, don't you? I mean, I wonder, you know, why Naomi said, we're just going to name you sickly and weak, right? You know, so I'm sure they got a lot of junior high jokes. Amen, right? Okay. So these names are important. Places are important. People are important. So let's talk about a couple of those. One is Ruth uh, comes from a group of, uh, called the Moabites. And if I said that in an audience of Ruth's contemporary time, they would probably be hissing. So could you hiss for me? Yeah, right. Let's try it again. The Moabites. All right, right. They were despised, right? They were enemies of Israel and of Judah, and they, they, were, folk, they were great enemies. Now, it's interesting where they come from. Their ancestral lineage is connected to Lot. Do you remember Lot? Abraham's nephew who left uh, Mesopotamia and came with him, but ended up living in Sodom and Gomorrah for a while. His wife becomes a pillar of salt, for which Morton Salt is very thankful, right? And then uh, he and his daughters uh, have a very bizarre relationship, which I'll save you the details. But in the end, that becomes the lineage of the Moabites. So they're pretty detested. It created a separation between Lot and Abraham. Uh, but that's who the Moabites are. And they lived in the same context and area of Israel, Judah, okay? And when, when the temple is destroyed, they rejoice. They, they actually betray some people. And in fact, they're very despised. So when we, we think that Ruth is a Moabite, I mean, really, she's an enemy, right? So that's important to know. The, so here we are with the story. And I'll do the best I can to keep it as brief as possible. So Naomi and Elimelech, remember, pleasant and God is my king, and their two sons, weak and sickly, right, are living in Judah. Actually, they live in Bethlehem, which means house of bread, plenty of bread. But for some reason, the house of bread has no bread because it's a famine, right? In fact, Scripture tells us they're in a deep famine. There's no food. And so uh, blessing and God is my king decide we got to move. And they look a lot and they do a lot of figuring it out. But Elimelech, uh, he gets a job on monster.com in Moab. Oh yeah. And I'm sure everybody in Bethlehem is like, what are you guys thinking? But it's a famine and they're in trouble and they have no food. And so Elimelech and Naomi and Ch Chilion and Malan, uh, they move and they move to Moabite, Moab and they begin a life among the Moabites. And they probably aren't well received. I don't know. We don't know any of that. But there they are for some time. We learn later that uh, uh, Elimelech dies, and this is an important thing to remember. So in the ancient world, especially in Israelite culture, uh, remember that a woman's life, means of uh, survival, financial means, is based in her husband, right? So when you lose your husband, you lose your status, right? And, and you can't work, and you can't do these things, so the reality is Elimelech's death puts her in a very difficult place in the ancient world, especially they are foreigners in a foreign land. They're immigrants in a foreign land, and so it puts her in a difficult place. But according to ancient law, if your husband dies, if you have sons, they restore you, right? So then she has sons who will provide for her, and they marry uh, two, two Moabite women, 
which was kind of scandalous, right? And they marry um, Orpah, and they marry Ruth. And those names are important too. And so they get married, and things seem to be okay. And then, as we probably already knew with weak and sickly, what do you think happened to them? They died. And I, I, I would think with those names, that's probably going to happen. Amen, right? So they die. Now think about the law of the ancient world, and especially Israelite law. Here are three women without husbands, so they have no status. And they're in trouble. And they're not even near family, or at least Ruth is, or Naomi is it. And so Naomi does a kind of an assessment of how things are going. And as you may remember, if you've known the story, she decides, I might as well move back to Bethlehem. Remember the house of bread? Maybe some things have turned around and there is some food. I have family there and I'll try to restore my life, and that's what she plans to do. Now, the other thing is Naomi decides to change her name. So she says, don't call me Naomi anymore, which means pleasant, but call me Mara, which means bitter. So uh, now we, 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 we exit out pleasant, and now we have a woman named Bitter, because she's so bitter. She blames God for what's happened. She doesn't know what she's done. She doesn't know if they're punished because they came to Moab. She doesn't know if she said something, done something, prayed something, acted in some way, but she's angry, she's, she's bitter. And, and this word is intense bitterness. I, I remember my Aunt Frances, who I, I love dearly, but her life kind of dealt her a lot of difficult challenges, and she was one of those folks who was most often bitter. I don't know if you have a relative like that or, uh, or a friend or somebody you know, but Nothing went right, and then it seemed like it just never went right, and then she, it was hard to be around her, you know what I'm saying, because she was always complaining and, and always unhappy and always cynical and always just never, never happy. I don't know, anybody know that person? Okay. So this is, this is what Mara, formerly known as Naomi, has become. So she begins to pack up, and she's leaving, and the two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, say, we're going with you. And they actually begin to travel with her. And Naomi just has this revelation, why are you doing this? Your families are here. You need to remarry. And there's this long story of her convincing them to go back to Moab and not travel with her. And in the end, though I think she's deeply saddened by it. Orpah hears her, and she goes back. But Ruth does something interesting in chapter 1. She says, I won't go back. And she does some of the words you heard read in our call to worship uh, your people will be my people. Wherever you go, I will go. Sometimes we read that at weddings, but it's really not a wedding text at all, right? It's really about Ruth saying, I'm leaving what I know. I'm leaving my old life behind, which not, wasn't necessarily bad, but because of my deep love for you, Naomi, despite you now being so bitter, I'm going to travel with you. I'm going to move with you. And just think about that. And I want you to, we don't really pay attention to this story well, do we? She's a Moabite, and she's moving into Bethlehem where she's despised. Do you hear what I'm saying? Here's this immigrant woman now coming from Moab to live in Bethlehem, and she is a Moabite. So there's this deep sense of anxiety. But she's so committed to Naomi that she does it. Now, the story is pretty detailed from here forward, but I just want you to hear it. So they get there, they settle in, I don't know where they stay. Naomi and uh, Elimelech still had their property, uh, but she really didn't have status to keep it, so that was becoming a legal challenge, right? And we don't see the details, but we know later in the story it was a problem. And so women or folks without means who needed food, according to uh, Levitical law, law in the Torah, could go to the fields after the harvest and gather what was left over. And so Naomi says, I can't do it, but Ruth, would you do it? And Ruth loves her so much. I just love Ruth, right? Amen? She just says, okay. And she goes to the fields. Now, here's another part of the story. We think that's so beautiful. Oh, she goes and gathers barley. But let me tell you what happens to women who gather among field workers in a field that they don't know. They're raped. They're killed. They're abused. They're made fun of. They're harassed. So it's a big risk for Ruth to do this. That's who Ruth is. She is so committed to the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that she's willing to put herself at risk. Well, God leads her to the field of Boaz. Now, Boaz is an interesting character, too. He's much older. 
He's never married, I guess, or maybe he has otherwise, and they're not named. Boaz has an interesting lineage as well, right? So uh, Rahab is in his lineage. I think she's his grandmother or great-grandmother. And Rahab, I love these stories, she was a prostitute in Jericho, okay? Yeah, so when I read about these families in the Old Testament, I kind of go, oh, my family's not so bad. You know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> We've got some problems, but here we go, right? So Boaz's family, he's a pretty prominent citizen. Long story short, Naomi, uh, he, she, uh, Ruth ends up in the field. She's gathering it. Uh, uh, Boaz sees her, and he finds out who she is. And, of course, the story of Naomi and this Moabite woman coming back to support her mother-in-law is all over town. And there's posts on Facebook and Twitter, and you know what I'm saying. Everybody knows it. But he's heard the story. And so this says something about Boaz's character. He says to the harvesters, throw some extra barley down, okay? Open up a bundle and make it spill. And what he does inevitably is help her to gather more barley than ever before. Naomi's pretty smart. So she says, this Boaz is a good guy, and she knows him because he's connected to the family and a relative of Elimelech. And so she does this interesting thing, which you heard read today. Uh, uh, so she says, uh, I want you to go uh, to Boaz at the threshing floor in the barn where he's threshing the grain. And I want you to uh, hide in the shadows till he's had a lot of wine and some barley loaves and then introduce yourself. I think you know the story, right? Okay, all right. Yeah. That you might know him, okay? So she does that. But Boaz doesn't act on that. He sees her and then he hears her story and then he does something very interesting. He says to her, wait till it's safe and go home so people don't know you were here. Then he fills her skirt or her apron with all kinds of barley and he sends her home and says, let's see if we can make this work. And then an interesting thing happens. So I know you're very familiar with Levitical law, amen? <laughs> right? So in the Torah, if your husband dies and you own land, uh, your husband's brother can marry you and restore his lineage. In fact, the children that you have are really your dead husband's children, not the children of the brother, right? It's a little bizarre, amen, right? Um, but we're not sure if there was a brother, but there was a relative, and Boaz knew there was a relative in front of him in the lineup. And he says, I have to go and talk to him. So they have a big meeting at the city gates the next morning, and he says, do you want to buy the land? And you're next in line, and let's get this settled so Naomi can be cared for. And the guy says, I want to do that. And he said, okay, just remember you also have to marry Ruth the Moabite. Well, you see what happens. The guy says, oh, I don't think I want to do that because then it messes up my lineage. My kids then go second place in the inheritance, so I forfeit it to you. And in the end, Boaz marries Ruth and restores the line. But it's interesting that in the last chapter of Ruth, there's less celebration about Ruth, though she's been a very loyal and beautiful and amazing and faithful person. It's all about Naomi, because she's called Naomi again. She's no longer bitter, but she's pleasant, right? And in many ways, as she holds the child, her life, her new direction, her new possibility have been restored. God has redeemed. That's what Mo Boaz's official title is in this, according to Hebrew. He's the redeemer. He's redeemed all this mess and restored Naomi. And she's just so grateful and blessed by this beautiful gift. And then it's interesting. The child they have is Obed. I'm sure you're familiar with Obed. I, you probably considered that name for your children as well, right? <laughs> uh, the deal is Obed is the grandfather to King David and also directly in the lineage of Jesus. So, Jesus, in his lineage, has a Moabite in there, amen, a foreign woman, and Rahab, who's a prostitute, and yet all of this is redeemed through the acts of love and grace and possibility when Ruth says, your people will be my, your God will be my, I will cleave to you and go with you and leave what I've known so that something new can happen. I think it's a powerful story. I think it says a lot to us. 
And I think it speaks especially to those of us who sometimes say, call me Mara because I'm really bitter. I think things are at their end. And yet, God is working in bizarre and amazing ways for the redemption of the world. Naomi went back to her name, Pleasant. I invite you to stand for our benediction. So when you hear the story of Naomi, it seems almost impossible. Amen? Amen. And then when you hear the story of Naomi, because of the love and loyalty and risk and faithfulness of Ruth, you see the possibility. Amen? Amen? So let us go forth from this place. And whatever we face, we face it as people who know that we will be God's people. God's people will be our people. And we will forever change the world with the help of Jesus. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen.